and then an old friend of mine I've not seen for some time will stop by and ask me hey, where you been what's on your mind they wonder why I'm not drinking and still painting this old town red I tell them I'm serving Jesus now and the old man is dead the man you see same old name but you're looking on the outside you could see inside instead you would see a brand new man for the old man is dead you see according to the word of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I used to live such a wicked life. I had no hope inside. I was lost in darkness, searching for the light. Then one night in a little church, after hearing what the preacher said, I gave my life to Jesus, and the old man was dead. The man you see before you may look a lot the same, may wear the same old name but you're looking on the outside you could see inside instead you would see a brand new man the old man is dead you're still looking on the outside you could see inside instead you would see a brand new man The old man is dead Thank God the old man is dead How many of you would say amen to that? Amen. Uh, me too, amen. Well, we'd like to do a song for the children. We've done it before here, wrote it many years ago, and um, for children, just wanted to see some more kids' songs, and you know what's interesting, we have a Songs for Children, a, a CD full of kids' songs. Why did that happen? Because a young lady in our church who has five children, and she was in the youth group, loved Herman the Bullfrog, now her kids are listening to Herman the Bullfrog, and she came to me one day, she said, Sammy, could you please write some new children's song. I am so tired of Herman the Bullfrog. <laughs> and you may be tired of Herman the Bullfrog, but we're going to do it again. But there's a story in this silly song that we don't want you to miss. There's a story uh, uh, in, about pride. The gospel is shared. Someone refuses. They're more interested in the world. But there was a price to pay. So this is Herman the Bullfrog. We need your help, all right? So help us out. Hello, children, now how are you? Fine, 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 fine. Now, this side was real strong. This side, you were a little weak, okay? <laughs> All right, Dad, lead the way over there, okay? Let's try it one more time, a little more volume. Let's get excited. I know some of you may be tired, 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 tired. But anyway, <laughs> let's do it again one more time. Hello, children, now how are you? Fine, 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 fine. Tell you right now what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you a story written just for you. About a wide mouth, blue eyed, educated, dignified, well footed, high jumping, full of pride, friend of mine, Herman the Bullfrog. 
You can find him in the evening sitting on a log, croaking and singing his favorite song. Gazing at himself in the waters there, combing and apart in his slimy hair. With his long yellow tongue in the wink of an eye, he can sneak up slow, catch his swallow fly. That's Herman. Herman the Bullfrog. He's got his very own pond, he knows Jungle Jim. He's got a hundred tadpoles named for him. He's king of the mud and the lily pad. What a wonderful life he has. He can jump up higher than the tallest pine. He can move a lot quicker than the naked eye. Turn a triple somersault, laughing all the time. Now one day, Lily the butterfly came a fluttering and flitting and a floating by. She said, hello, Herman, how are you? Got a thing or two to ask of you. Where you gonna go when you die? Where you gonna be in eternity? And what are you gonna say on that fateful day? Don't you know Jesus lived and died, rose again for you? Now what old Herman say? Now go on, Lily, why can't you see? I got flies to catch and frogs to meet. There ain't no need to hurry, I got time. So goodbye, girl, won't you move along? Don't bother me, I'm having too much fun. Sing your song to someone new, not me. But little did Herman the bullfrog know that very same moment down deep below there was a one-eyed alligator marking time, watching and waiting with a hungry eye. Poor Herman Dovin, right before my eyes, that one-eyed gator caught him by surprise, swallowed him whole in the wink of an eye. He never had a chance to say goodbye. Now Lily, she cried and said with a sigh, Herman, I tried, I tried and tried, but you lived your life and died so foolishly. And you were so hung up on frogs and flies and thinking that you had lots of time. It's too late now, it's too late now for you. So boys and girls, please listen good. Don't do like a dumb old bullfrog would. Please don't wait, say yes to Jesus now. And if Herman, he could have a word with you, well, I'm sure he'd say the same thing too. Please don't wait, say yes to Jesus now. And all God's people said, Amen. Brother? Thank you, brother. Well, here we are again. And thank you. Uh, just looked on my phone. I was sharing with somebody back there in the back. I think it was Stephanie. And uh, it's colder in North Carolina than it is here. It's crazy. And I also said that, you know, the weather, we were talking about how the weather's been so crazy lately. And I believe that this earth is groaning in anticipation of the Savior's return. Amen? And I think we're going to see a lot crazier weather than what we're seeing here. So I want to ask you a question tonight, right at the beginning here. How many of you, after you got saved, ever doubted your salvation? Anybody? Okay, several hands. Well, my hand was up too, and I'll tell you my story here in just a little bit. And so we're trying to encourage you as we've been here. And I think one of the things that can encourage Christians is to know how secure they are in Christ. As I go across the country, I meet so many people um, that just struggle and struggle and struggle with the security of their salvation. And we're going to be talking about that tonight. And so I want to start off before I open the word of God and sing a song that I wrote many years ago. I was in a hotel room in Nicholasville, Kentucky. I had a friend of mine and his wife, and they could not have children, so they adopted a little boy, and they named him Hudson Taylor after the Chinese missionary. And uh, when he went to the courtroom to sign the papers to adopt this little boy, the judge told him this. He said, now, when you put your name on this piece of paper, he said, you can never, ever write him out of your will. He said, if God allows you to have children of your own, you can write them out of your will if you want to. But by law, you can never, ever write this boy out of your will, which is a beautiful picture of eternal security. Now, you won't find the words eternal security in the Bible, but you will find the words everlasting life and eternal life. 
How long is everlasting? How long is eternal? It's forever. Amen? And so we're going to talk about that tonight. And then uh, after they adopted little Hudson, then his wife did get pregnant and uh, had a little baby boy and named him Evan Roberts after an evangelist. And then she got pregnant again, had another little boy, named him Malachi Gregory. And he said, Brother Bruce, he said, I've got a missionary, I've got an evangelist, and now I have a tither. I think I'll start a church. <laughs> and so they asked me if I would pray about writing a song about adoption. And in that hotel room in Nicholasville, Kentucky, God allowed me to write this song. Came into this world alone, no family or home. Lost and without hope. Though our blood was not the same, you gave me your last name, and I became your own. Adopted by your love for me, a brand new family that I can call my own. Gave me clothes and food to eat, took care of my every need when I was but a youth. You shared God's precious word with me so that I could clearly see the promise of his truth. Adopted by your love for me, a brand new family that I can call my own. Came into this world alone, no family or home, lost and without hope. Though our blood was not the same, you heard when I called your name, and I became your own. Adopted by your love for me, a brand new family that I can call my own. Thank you, Lord, for saving me for my earthly family. And for heaven I call home. Amen. If you're here tonight, you've been born again, you've been saved, you've been adopted into the family of God. Hallelujah. And nobody can ever take that from you. And we're going to look at scripture here that proves that as we open our Bibles to 1 John in chapter 5 with me this tonight, if you will, please. And Sammy and I, again, want to thank you so much for allowing us to come. Thank you for the wonderful place to stay. Thank you for the meals. Thank you for your kindness to us. And thank you for uh, coming every night. I know you, many of you have worked all day and you're tired. And we appreciate your faithfulness to the Lord. And hope that this uh, message tonight will be a blessing and a help to you this evening. In 1 John, in chapter 5, and <clears throat> verse 11, the Bible says this, And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I shared this scripture, as I told you Sunday morning in Sunday school, with a Catholic priest that morning, and shared with him the fact that he could know he was going to heaven. If he didn't accept uh, Christ as his Savior on that airplane that day, I wish he would have. But I want to, tonight, with God's help, give you three truths about being secure in Christ. Three truths about being secure in Christ. Truth number one, you are saved by God. I heard a, a preacher say one time, if I was the devil, I would make all the lost people 
think they were saved, and all the saved people think they were lost. <laughs> and we can find security in many things, money, health, a job, a family, talents, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, etc. When I was young, I found my security in my routine. I was a little kid, just like Sammy. I had the same mama that shaved my head the same way she shaved his head. And uh, I went to school, and we had a kind of different system there. The, the school bus would come and pick us up. And we had this long dirt road that we had to walk up there, get on the school bus, and we'd get to school. And uh, this was my routine. Every morning when I got to school, I'd go into the lunchroom, and they'd give you some cereal, and we'd eat our cereal, and then we'd go to our classroom. And then the day would start. And of course, I always tell people that uh, I went through school basically untouched by education because I just didn't pay attention much of the time. And I always told her, she said, Bruce, would you like to read? And I said, no, ma'am, just let me go back there and play with the Play-Doh and leave me alone. I, I just don't want to learn anything. And so here I am not paying attention and that kind of thing. And so I'm in the classroom one day. And what happens is that we would get there to the classroom and she would start teaching and whatever. And then we would go to lunch, and then after lunch, we'd come back and we'd have more schooling, and then a bell would ring. Now, when that first bell rang, that was my cue to go get my jacket and put it on, go get my book satchel, put my books in it, and put them on, and then sit down and wait for the second bell to ring. And then, as soon as the second bell rang, I'd go upstairs and sit down and wait for the second load bus. And it had been that way the whole time I'd been in school. Every day was the same. And I was very secure in that. I, I was okay with that. And then one day, they decided to have a fire drill. Now I'm back there playing with the Play-Doh, not paying attention, and all of a sudden, everybody gets in a line in the front of the classroom. And they're all standing there, and uh, I hear a bell ring. And what it was, it was a bell for the fire drill which I didn't hear anything about because I wasn't listening and I wasn't paying attention. So when the bell rang, I went, oh, that's the first bell. So I got my jacket on. I got my books. I put them in my book satchel. I put my book satchel on. I went and sat down in my desk waiting for the second bell to ring. Now everybody else is standing in front of the, uh, of the classroom all in a line. And Miss Jenkins, my teacher, she said, Bruce, you need to come and get in line with the class. I said, no, ma'am, I'm not doing that. She said, why not? I said, because I'm waiting for that second bell. It's been like that ever since I've been here. And as soon as the second bell rings, then I'm going to go upstairs and wait for the second load bus. That's just the way it is. She said, well, look, we're having a fire drill. And I said, well, go ahead and have it. I'll be right here. <laughs> you know? And she said, no, you don't understand. You have got to do this. You have got to get in line with the class. I said, uh-uh, because I'm just confused. I wasn't paying attention. I didn't know anything about the fire drill. So I'm sitting there, and I said, I'm waiting for the second bell, and I'm going to do like I've done ever since I've been here, since the first grade. And so she started walking towards me, and when she did, I got scared. I got out of my chair, and she started chasing me around the room. And for an old lady, she was really fast. <laughs> she grabbed my book satchel, and I slid out of that thing. And then she called up with me, grabbed my jacket. I came out of my jacket. Now, the... The door, we had two doors, one that went to the hallway and one that went outside. And all the kids are pointed this way to go outside for the fire drill, right? I saw that door open, and <laughs> many of you may have never seen the Wizard of Oz, but like the line on the Wizard of Oz, I hid out that door, ran down that hallway, and there were two doors that went out like this, and I went out them two doors, and there was a, some steps that went down like this, and a bunch of bushes and kudzu right there, and I dove in there like this. I mean, I was scared to death. I was just... I lost my mind. And so I'm hiding in the bushes. And then I poke out and I look and I see all the lines of all these people. All the classrooms are outside. And it hit me. I went, oh, fire drill. <laughs> I was a slow kid, okay? And I went, oh, man, what have I done? What have I done? And then all of a sudden, my friend Jeff came walking around the corner. And I said, hey, Jeff, where are you going? And he went, you in trouble, boy. And I said, I know. I said, where are you going? He, he, he said, I'm going to unlock the door so everybody can come back in. I said, well, I'll just go with you, and maybe I'll sit down in my chair, and she won't. She'll forget about it. 
So I went back, sat down in the chair, and everybody came in and sat down. And she did this big illustration, and she, she struck a match and then put a, a jar over top of it, snuffed it out, and showed how my life could have been snuffed out because I didn't obey the rules and do the fire drill. But I was so secure in doing the same thing every day. When that was messed up, it messed me up. And you know, it's a good thing to be secure about your salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And here... Again, in the passage of Scripture, it says, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. It says, hath given. It's not something you're going to get. It's something you already have right this very moment. And then, of course, uh, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know. Now, this verse states that you can know. That's present tense, that you have eternal life. It's not something you're going to get. It's in your possession right now. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith. You are saved. Not were saved. You are saved. Again, this is a present tense verb. You became saved by the, uh, God's grace. You remain saved by God's grace. You became saved by uh, Christ's work on the cross. You remain saved by Christ's work work on the cross, the salvation you receive by grace, God's undeserved favor, you continue in by grace. Now, many of you, and I mentioned this here before, I think one other time when I was here, a lot of churches teach that we're all children of God, but that's not true. We're all created by God, but you don't become a child of God until you're born again into his family. At that moment, when in your heart you say, yes, God, I will trust Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. At that moment, you become a child of of the living God. And the Bible says uh, in John 3, 7, ye must be born again. Galatians 3, 26, for ye are all the children of God, here it is, by faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And John 1, 13 says, which were born not of blood, nor the will, uh, uh, will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So nothing we can do can merit salvation, so there's nothing we can do to keep it ourselves. When you trust Christ, He gives you the right to become His child. I am the son of my father, and his name is Sam Fry. My brother is named after my dad. And I've done many things that would surely cause my dad not to claim me. I left home when I was 17. I got in trouble with the law. And a lot of times I'm sure he didn't want to claim me. But he can never deny that I am his son. I look just like him, one thing. But his blood runs through my veins. And if that's true of my earthly father, how much more is that true of my heavenly father? I am his son by adoption. And though I have done many things that would cause my heavenly father not to want to claim me, he will never deny that I am his son, not because his blood flows through my veins, but because his son's blood covers my stains. When God looks at me now, he doesn't see my sin. He sees the blood of his son, which covers my sin. Hallelujah. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. Though your sin hurts your fellowship with God, your relationship as his child is eternal and unchanging. You know, when you, got, when you were born into your mom and dad's family, you can't be unborn, can you? So when you're born again, you can't be unborn again. It's the same thing. Once you're born again, you're born again. You can't be unborn again. Um, now, David, a man after God's own heart, sinned and for a year or so was out of fellowship with God. But he, rep he repented and got right with God, and he got his joy back. He didn't lose his salvation, but he lost his joy. Psalm 51, 12, he said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. You cannot lose your salvation, but if you're a Christian and you're living in sin or out of fellowship with God, you sure don't have any joy in your life. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Your conduct can affect your fellowship with God, but not your relationship with him. And at salvation, Jesus' righteousness was imputed unto you. This is a banking term, added to your account or counted for your credit. Romans 4.11 says that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. 
Romans 4.23, that it was imputed to him. Romans 4.24, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. And Romans 5.1 says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5.2 by whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And Romans 8, 30 says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So truth number one, you are saved by God. Truth number two, you are kept by God. Not only are you saved by God, but you are kept by God. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1.12 For which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. In Jude chapter 1, of course there's only one chapter there, verse 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. John 17, 11 says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world that I am come uh, to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. And the next verse says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. See, scripture teaches that true believers are indeed secure in Christ, secure to obey, not secure to sin. Because some people say, well, if you think you know you're going to heaven, you can just live like you want to. No, you can't either. No, if you're truly a child of God, you should want to sin less than you did before you got saved. Amen? And uh, it's a wonderful thing. The true believer walks in obedience but is not motivated by fear like those who believe they can lose their salvation. Rather, they are motivated by love for our gracious Savior. The difference is life changing. See, if you believe that you can lose your salvation, you're going to live in fear for the rest of your life. I talked to a guy one time that uh, he said he thought you could lose your salvation. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, if if somebody wants to come to Jesus Christ in a meeting like this, I said, and you take him to the altar and you tell him, hey, if you want to trust Christ, you can bow your head and, and uh, repent of your sins and trust Christ as your Savior, but then you're going to have to do this and this to keep saved. I said, isn't that kind of crazy to think like that? And he said, well, you know, I think that you're, you're saved when you get saved, but then you have to persevere. And so what they're saying is they're adding works to grace. Amen. Now, I don't persevere because I'm doing that so I can go to heaven. I'm already going to heaven. I persevere because I'm going to heaven. I'm doing what I'm, I do, hopefully, for the glory of God. The Bible says in Romans 8, 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Titus 1, 2, In hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And 1 Peter 1, 3 says, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. So in this uh, situation here about eternal security, we need to take God at his word. He, he said he would give you eternal life, not part-time life. He didn't say he would give you five-year life. He didn't say he would give you ten-year life. When he saved you, he said he gave you eternal life. 
And as we said before, that is forever. Faith lives in the quickened spirit we received at the moment of salvation, but feelings live in the soul where our emotions are, which can change from day to day. I heard a preacher say one time, your emotions are the most shallowest part of your being, and God never does his deepest work in the shallowest part. The thing about it is, is that when you start going on your feelings, I mean, some days you're going to feel saved, some days you're not going to feel saved. You know, if you're like me, sometimes I think thoughts. Even when I'm preaching, I'll think some thoughts. I'm like, where is that? But you know, there's a battle going on in here. And that's why God tells us in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because the devil is going to attack your mind. And if he can get you to thinking wrong, then you'll start doing wrong or heading the wrong direction. When I got saved, March the 10th of 1998, I mean, I cried out to God, and my life just totally changed. And I was so excited that now I knew that I was heaven-born and heaven-bound, and I had this book, and I wanted to read it every minute of every day. But you can't do that. I would come home from work after working all day long, and I had a little table there in my dining room area, and I had my, my Bible and my study notes and all this stuff all scattered around, and I would read, and I would start getting sleepy. And my head would start bobbing, so I'd get up and take my Bible, and I'd start walking around. And I said, God, I don't want to go to sleep. I want to keep reading. And after about three or four weeks of that, not getting any sleep, maybe only sleeping like three, four hours a night, my body was crying out for rest. There's a thing called sleep deprivation, and I think Sammy mentioned this, you know, sometimes we need to get some rest, and here it was, I was, I was depriving myself of rest, and all of a sudden, it scared me, because I started thinking, oh man, I don't want to never feel like this, you know, never not feel like this, because I felt so great. I mean, when I got saved, I walked out, I lived eight miles from downtown Nashville, Tennessee, and when you live that close to the city, it really doesn't smell that great. When I walked out there that day, I went, wow, it smells good out here. <laughs> I said, I've never seen the sky this blue. I could hear the birds. Everything changed. I walked back in the house, turned my television on, and MTV was on there. And I went, oh, that looks like hell. And what happened? God had removed the scales from my eyes. I was seeing things different. I was seeing God's world like I'd never seen it before. And I didn't want that to change. I didn't want to ever lose this feeling that I had. I felt so clean. And so that night, I was walking around, and I said, God, I don't want to never not feel like this again, because all of a sudden, I was basing my salvation on how I felt, and I got scared. So I went in the bedroom, right where I got saved, I dropped my Bible on the bed, and I fell on my knees right in the very spot where I trusted Christ as my Savior. Guess where my Bible fell open to? First John. Now, I was a brand-new baby Christian. I didn't know that the first John was the assurance chapters in the Bible. And on my knees, I said, God, you have got to speak to me. I'm scared. I feel like I'm losing what you've given me, and I don't want to, I don't want to lose this feeling. Again, I was basing it on how I felt. And so I read first John. I read second John. I read third John. I went back. I don't know how long I stayed on my knees. I don't know how many times I read it, but all of a sudden it was like a light bulb just busted in my head. And I went, it doesn't matter how I feel. I'm saved by faith. And I closed my Bible. And I said, thank you, Lord, for speaking to me. And I crawled into the bed. You talk about sleeping. Woo, son. Man, I slept good that night. Proverbs 3, 24. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. And I have never doubted my salvation since that day. And God was so good to me to speak to me through his word. Truth number one, you are saved by God. Truth number two, you are kept by God. And truth number three, you are preserved by God. You are preserved by God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
In Psalm 145, 10, the Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. Perseverance, doing what works to stay saved, is teaching that genuine believers will all persevere until the day they are with Christ in heaven. The focus is on the Christian. The truth is we persevere because we are saved, not to stay saved. I said I mentioned that just a moment ago. 1 John 2.19 says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest. That word manifest means brought to light that they were not all of us. This verse teaches that those that don't persevere do not lose their salvation. Rather, they prove that they were never believers in the first place. You can't be sure of something you've never had. That's for sure. First, preservation, on the other hand, focuses not on the Christian, but on God himself. Hebrews 13, 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth, that's present tense, my word, and believeth, there is present tense, on him that sent me, hath, present tense, everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, that's future sense, future tense, but it's past, past tense, already past, from death unto life. And John uh, thir- uh, 6, 37 says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. And John six thirty nine says, And this is the Father's will, which he has sent me, that all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again. At the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me. That everyone. Which seeth the son and believeth on him. May have everlasting life. And I will raise him up. At the last day. Psalm 121 5 says. The Lord is my keeper. Psalm 121 8 says. The Lord shall preserve thy going out. And thy coming in from this time forth. And forevermore. Sammy taught me this illustration. And I, and I use it all the time. I'm going to take this guitar pick and imagine that this is me. And the moment that I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I was placed in the hand of the Father, in the hand of the Son, and sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And the Bible says that no man can take that from me. John 10, 27 through 30. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And Ephesians 1.13 says we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That means that you cannot take my salvation from me. I'm a man. I can't take it from myself. I'm eternally secure in Christ. Wow. What a wonderful, wonderful thought. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. I'm going to come back to that. I want to just, uh, I'm not going to take you there, but in Genesis chapter 15, verses 5 through 20, God made a covenant with us. God made a covenant with us. I'm going to read this so I don't get it wrong. In the ancient Near East, a treaty between a superior, a lord, or a king was called a cesarean treaty. The ratification or validation or confirmation or authorization of that ceremony required animals to be sacrificed and cut in half. The animal parts were then arranged in two rows on the ground, forming an aisle between them. As the cesarean walked between the two halves, he was publicly declaring he would keep the covenant and would would become like the slain animals if he failed to keep his word. When Abraham asked God, how he could be sure his promises would come to pass. God used this culturally significant symbolism of the Caesarean Treaty to affirm his promise. When the torch passed through the pieces of the sacrifice, Abraham understood God was declaring it was his job to keep the covenant. Not Abraham's job, but God's job to keep the covenant. We're saved by grace. John Newton (laughs) understood this doctrine when he wrote that wonderful, wonderful song. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The United States Bullion, I'm going to make sure I pronounce this right, depository. <laughs> this is, I say it the wrong way every time. 
<laughs> oh, my life. Well, it's in Fort Knox. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's a fortified building that stores 5,000 tons of gold bullion, other precious items entrusted to the federal government. Fort Knox is protected by a 22-ton door, layers of physical security, alarms, video cameras, minefield, barbed razor wire, electric fences, armed guards, and unmarked Apache helicopter. And based on the security, Fort Knox is considered one of the safest places on earth. But as safe as that is, there's another place that is safer and is filled with something more precious than gold. Heaven holds our gift of eternal life. And you can't have better security than that. You are secure in Christ. I remember years ago after I got saved, I, I started thinking about my life. And I don't know if I shared this here with you before, but I'm telling you, I didn't get saved till I was 43 years old. And I got to thinking, 43 years. I have wasted 43 years of my life on myself. And I mean, it just got over, all over me, and I was really depressed. And I went by to see Brother Sammy one day, and when I walked in his office, I was weeping. And he said, Brother, what's wrong with you? And I said, Sammy, I've been thinking about all the years that I've wasted on myself, 43 years, and I, I could have been serving the Lord, and I was just all messed up. And he said, Brother, sit down. He said, I want to read something to you, and I want you to memorize these verses. And it was Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. My brother, and I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the uh, mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He said, brother, your past is under the blood of Christ. And he said, and if you continue to live there, you'll never do anything for God in the future. And I remember when he said that to me, it just took a load and a weight off of me. And I realized, you know what? I just need to be thankful. Number one, that I'm saved. Thankful that I can never be unsaved. And that God is going to preserve me until the day. Whether I go in the rapture or whether in death, I'm heaven born and I'm heaven bound. Amen. Are you secure tonight in Christ? Do you know for sure that if you died right where you're sitting right now, you'd go to heaven? Do you have a doubt about that? If you do, I sure would like to help you tonight. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? With every, every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you a question. Nobody's looking around just between me and you and God. You say, Brother Bruce, would you pray for me? Because I am right now in my spirit doubting my salvation if that's you would you let me pray for you i won't come to you i won't embarrass you but i would love to pray for you if you just raise your hand and say bruce pray for me because i've been struggling am i truly a child of god if i die will i go to heaven i want to know that's true is there anybody i could pray for like that tonight anybody at all i'm not seeing any hands tonight but there may be somebody that's listening online and I want to encourage you, if you are and you're having doubts about your salvation, you're not sure that you're secure in Christ, would you please call this church? This dear man of God would love to help you with that. And you know what? You want to encourage yourself in the Lord? Thank God that you're secure in Jesus Christ. Would you stand with your head bowed and your eyes closed? And I'm going to let Pastor come and take the rest of the service. We'll just spend a few moments here as the pianist is going to play, but a lot of powerful truths about assurance. You know, that was the one thing that got me thinking years ago about what, where I would go when I died. You know, for years I tried to be a good person. I did, I followed through with various sacraments my church taught and just believed that I guess I found out, but when that was challenged by somebody who cared and said, you know, if you died right now, are you 100% sure? And I said, well, I hope so, but I don't know that for sure. And they share with me that one verse, 1 John 5, 13, and it began to make me think a little bit, like I can know for sure that when I die, I'll go to heaven. 
And I wanted to know that because of some of the things that had been going on in my life and the things I had been thinking about. You know, if you don't have that assurance tonight, or like you mentioned, if you're online and, and listening, that is the most important question you need solved. And God, uh, God has the answer for that. You know, many people, the Bible mentions in the book of Hebrews that Jesus Christ, when he came, he, he destroyed the works of the devil. And one of the things that was destroyed was that fear of death because we're, the Bible mentions that we're all our lifetime subject to bondage. You can't, you're not prepared to live until you're prepared to die. Amen. I mean, there's, there's just no way you can live the way God would want you to live until that's settled. And tonight, if, if God's been speaking to your heart about anything like that, or maybe you've, you've made a profession of faith and kind of struggled and you, you, you understood what you were doing, you understood things, but maybe sometimes we, we, we think about the, our past or maybe just how we feel. Thank goodness, thank God we're not, uh, uh, our assurance isn't based on how we feel. <laughs> sometimes we don't feel all that great, do we? But it's based on the promises and the truths of God's word. A lot, a lot of scripture tonight. But that's where you'll get your assurance. Is by, is, is by just letting the word of God speak to your heart. I remember years ago, I was struggling with it a little bit. And I just went to the word of God to prove, my, prove to myself that I need to get saved. Interestingly enough, it did the opposite. It gave me assurance. The word of God will either show you your state or it will... Uh, of salvation being secure or else it will show you your need just draw near to it and God's spirit will do the rest great truths tonight we saw may God use it how he's how he needs to in our lives Father, we thank you for the truth that we saw tonight from thy word. And, and Lord, it's such a powerful thing. It's, that it's a, one of the biggest questions that needs to be answered is, do I have assurance of salvation? And am I on the road to heaven? Am I right with you? And Lord, if we do not get that settled before it's eternally too late, Lord God, there's a, a, eternity is just too long to, to consider without that salvation being wrought. And Father, I pray tonight. If there be any here today that that are struggling with that, that these these verses were helpful, or if there be any here tonight for some reason that just they're not saved, and you've uh, been speaking to them, I pray that you get a hold of their heart so that they can have that assurance. Thank you, Lord, for this night. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate that a lot tonight. You know, more people actually, I think, struggle with that than you really realize. They not, not always like to talk about that, but I think, I think some more people struggle with that because they, they see their imperfections or they feel a certain way certain days, and, and uh, our, our salvation is based on what God says, not Amen. the way we, we necessarily feel. So that we, we thank the Lord for that and that he holds us and he never lets us go. Amen. And that's, a, <laughs> I'm glad... Because if it was up to me, I'd lost it a long time ago. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know, so we're thankful that God does that for us. Well, tomorrow night, the final night, and uh, these conferences go a lot quicker than you realize. And we're praying that the Lord will use the final night in a very, very special way. Uh, be praying for it. If you know of anybody that you can invite out, invite them to come. And uh, we're going to finish the things off strong. Amen. And as we uh, get ready for the summer and all that the Lord would have for us to do. So I'm just going to go ahead tonight and close with a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for your goodness tonight. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the assurance that you give through it. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness in providing it for us. And Lord, we're so glad that you were willing to pay that price so that, on the cross so that um, we, uh, we as people can be with you forever. And and, and to know it before we die and not wonder and guess and, and have false hope, but to have assurance from thy word. Father, bless what was spoken tonight, and may you bring us back tomorrow night with hearts enlarged, hearts ready to, to hear from thy word. In Jesus' name we pray.